and uh, welcome everyone to our track on Inner Source in Government, which I am very much looking forward to with my two wonderful guests. So to kick off, I just want to say hello. I'm Claire Dillon. Um, uh, I'm actually currently a researcher doing a PhD, re um, researching my PhD with the University of Galway. And for the last number of years, I've been working as executive director with the Inner Source Commons, taking that love of Inner Source, trying to get more research into it. And as part of that, I've been involved in, in learning a little bit more about the collaboration practices in public sector organizations like universities, but in particular governments, because it's a particularly interesting area when we think about open source practices and inner source practices. So to start with, I'm going to introduce or get my wonderful guests to introduce themselves. So Remy and Hans, would you like to give an introduction as to, you know, where you're coming from, what your role is, and a very, very brief touch on, on how you're thinking about inner source in your organization. Remy, I'll start with you. Hi there, everybody. Uh, good to be here. Thank you, Claire. Thank you, Inner Source Commons, for having me. Uh, my name is Remy DeCosmaker, and I'm the open source lead here at the Digital Services at CMS, which is the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, I'm on a four-year tour of duty. Uh, and my role is, you know, helping contributors work together to use their powers for good inside and outside of the federal government. And I will pass it to U.S. federal government. We are international. And I will pass it to Hans. Hi, Hans here. Um, so I'm from the Norwegian government. Uh, my role is on the platform team. And uh, we have been the team that sort of spearheaded uh, some of the open source and inner source movement, adopting GitHub and, and adopting open source and sharing code both internally and uh, externally. So uh, while we don't have someone in charge of our inner source or open source, we do have sort of a lovely community um, with some of our really, really engaged engineers that sort of share their passion for inner source and as well as open source. So really, really uh, grateful to be here today. Thank you, Hans. Now, one of the inspirations for this panel session was actually a previous conversation I had had with Remy. So I'm going to recap some of that because um, for me, I thought it was really interesting to hear, Remy, how you in, um, in Medicare and Medicaid, how you're considering inner source in the broader context of your open source strategy. So you, you talked about having kind of different considerations about what types of projects, how you approach certain types of projects in terms of how open you want to be. Um, and I know this conversation has been great in the summit today so far. So can you elaborate on how you approach that challenge? Yes. So uh, taking a page out of the inner source playbook, as well as our friends from the Apache Software Foundation, and the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, uh, maturity models are a really common way to sort of understand where projects are in their journey. So uh, we post in chat just a moment ago, some links to a repository called Repo Scaffolder. Uh, inside of that repository is a very early version. We just kind of cut it, you know, in the last week or so. So, you know, you're getting a sort of first view here. Uh, and this is sort of how we break down projects into tiers. So tier zero is just a private repository and table stakes for like saving your code. Uh, tier one is projects that are a one-time release. So you just want to get it out there and publish for transparency sake or for a paper or for a conference. Um, there's no expectation of sort of contributions coming back and forth. Our tier two is sort of where the inner source project definition lies. And that's sort of defined as a close collaboration where you have a repository, you know you're going to be working across teams, uh, but not necessarily working in the open yet or at all, depending. Uh, in the world of government, uh, there actually are some reasons why we can't have all of the things open source, either because of a federal regulation that statutorily defines it, or in the cases of national security, for example. Um, there are other reasons as well, but uh, generally speaking, you know, we're very lucky in the federal government that you know, we default to open in a lot of cases. So, um, you know, public domain, Creative Commons 0, 1.0 uh, is the default license that we encourage folks to put on their repos and to release under. So in the cases that um, folks are not able to do that work, we still want them to use the same guidelines and strategies of doing open development and 
the best practices from distributed collaboration inside of their repositories, even if it's a close, uh, close collaboration project. So um, InnerSource is part of that continuum or spectrum, if you will, on the journey to being open. And uh, tier three is projects that are working in public. That is, there is an expectation that you're working on public GitHub, but not necessarily that you are having an open governance model where people are going to be defining the roadmap from outside. Again, that's in the case of like statutorily defined projects where Congress says thou shalt have a project that does X, Y, or Z. And, you know, that's the law. So uh, it's kind of a special case. I haven't had Congress be a blocker in a lot of my previous open source work. But uh, so that's tier three. And then tier four is open community. So with open governance, sort of classic style, you know, how do you get involved in the project? How do you move from, you know, a user to a contributor, to a maintainer, to a lead? And having that structure and that open governance model defined and well-defined explicitly. So those are sort of the five tiers that we have in our maturity model now. Uh, we have been working with the United States Digital Response, which is a nonprofit civic tech organization that has volunteers that help government and public sector employees deliver cool solutions and do good work. Uh, along by the Department of Health and Human Services, CMS, and the United States Digital Service. So that repo is in Slack if people want to check it out. Uh, I will cede my time though, because you know we have a, a short block, and I definitely want to hear what Hans is doing over in his neck of the woods. Great, thank you. So Hans, I'll come to you. So we've heard how Remy kind of considers projects with a now published maturity model. Excellent. We've got, you know, launch rights on that for the, for the summit. That's fantastic. Or at least first time we've heard about it here. Um, but Hans, do you want to maybe comment about how that works in Norway? Is it so structured in terms of the choices people have? Are they aware of that that structure? Do you want to take the maturity model that, that Remy has just shared? <laughs> Tell us all. Yeah, I love the structure Rami is just presenting here, and uh, it, it's so cool that the structure as well is open. Um, no, open uh, inner source and uh, open source is not that common in in Norway. And I believe sort of the the agency that I represent, the um, Labor and Welfare Administration, has been sort of the spearhead here. There have been pockets over here and there, but really sort of. Um, uh, public text, pu uh, Creative Commons, and uh, isn't isn't really that sort of uh, common in Norway, unfortunately, or wasn't. Uh, so this this whole um, inner source for our part, the neck of the woods at least, uh, was really sort of the engineers saw that this is the practice, this is the way, this is how we need to go forward. And at that point, it was just a lucky spot because at that point we had new management because things were going really, really poorly <laughs> over at the welfare and administration <laughs> and so they just decided that okay let's let's listen to the engineers and and try to try it their way for a change <laughs> so with that sort of we got this inner source that um by default uh, all projects at least within the uh, labor and welfare administration it's it's open to all employees there uh and also that we we wanted to go that go further uh, because we are consuming so much open source as well and and really building on top of uh, on the shoulder of, of giants who really sort of contributing back uh, by sort of open sourcing our own uh, projects as well and really believing that this is this is the way to build trust within government that government should be transparent it's already funded by the by the public of course the code should be public as well and and, and just echoing what what Remy said that yes of course there are things that are uh, laws that aren't pa passed yet and, and we can't open source those uh, projects and, and there are things that are national security matters um, we tend to have don't, don't have that much of them in, in the labor and welfare and administration so generally sort of uh, we we can open source really really much of, of, of what we are doing that's brilliant and it's so interesting to see that that was a developer-led decision or, or movement almost in terms of the Norwegian government and I know when we talked earlier you were talking about how that has actually changed the perception of working in the public sector in Norway so can you maybe comment on that because I think it's a really interesting one that talent acquisition challenge is is, is huge I think worldwide so if, if it has made a difference let's hear it yeah, absolutely. Uh, so uh, I, I think this is very similar to 
most countries that uh, there is a shortage of uh, skilled uh, engineers, especially in, in computer science and, and uh, developers in general. And what we have actually seen is that uh, allowing our developers and our consultants as well, we have a lot of consultants and we, we really rely on consultants as well, but allowing them to actually be able to share their code and sort of be able to bring that home and, and sort of uh, using GitHub as their sort of public CV, that has really, really attracted talents. And, and it's one of the things that really uh, gets people uh, engaged and, and oh, this, this is so cool. And I, I really want to make this really great because people are, I, I can really show this to others and, and they can get some benefit as well. So uh, we had a record uh, number of uh, applicants for our uh, new new uh, higher positions this year and and some of them it's is really really thanks to sort of some of the technology de decisions and also our ability to be open and transparent that's fantastic and, and it's it's such a it's such a powerful message i mean we're hearing more and more links between inner source and developer experience but when you hear it in reality as being a key factor to people joining organizations it's always it's always great to hear that and so coming back to you Remy because when you were describing your five or however many stages that there were in the maturity model certainly five examples um you you mentioned that actually in many respects very few of them it sounded like very few of them then are actually fully closed and i'm just i'm curious then was i right in that is is you know are the majority then coming into either the inner source or open source model in 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 your organization would that be a true statement so it is hard for me to say what it is because the federal government unlike other OSPOs that I have been a part of. So we are, A, we're just launching our OSPO at CMS. We believe we have the first federal OSPO at an agency in the United States. So uh, this is still very early in our journey. Uh, but uh, when we look at the, the topology, normally in an OSPO, you have like one IT department and one legal department and one procurement department, but that is absolutely not the case. Inside of the Department of Health and Human Services, there are 13 different operational divisions. And within those, they have multiple IT organizations. And within those, they have multiple budget authorities. So it is much more of a community of communities and sort of like a very nested Venn diagram. So I can speak a little bit to like our corner of CMS in the digital service, or I can speak to our you know, Office of Enterprise Data and Analytics. So those places tend to have a lot more open source projects because that's where they are specifically built for providing open APIs and clients and access and data. So uh, different parts are at different points in their journey. And I think the important message that I want to take away from this is that um, there's a, you know, not just in government, but generally in large organizations, this tension that we would sort of talk about during the unconference of wanting to really just assume everything should be really held closely to the chest and protect IP. And a big part of what an OSPO does is help to align those stakeholder interests so that you reduce the amount of fear and uncertainty that comes from sharing. So you can say, okay, does it touch internal systems? Does it have PII or PHI? And does it do anything in security? If all three of those things are not true, or does it have any, is it a standalone project with no dependencies? If you say no to all those things, then there should be a different outbound approval process and maybe a different risk analysis that's done. So when you start to differentiate the easy problems from the harder problems or the high risk from the low risk, and there are a lot of other systems as well, FISMA compliance and uh, you know, TechFAR, there are a variety of policies I'm still getting spun up on as a new, uh, a baby fed, if you will. But um, there are a lot of considerations that go into defining what those projects should be. Um, so there is a whole spectrum. And depending on what part you're in, uh, you will see different levels. And an OSPO is really meant to be a center of gravity to help all of those people along on their journey. So that's why we have all these different maturity models. So we can say, hey, there isn't one ideal situation. The maturity model, the tiers aren't necessarily all going to be like a sequential order. Like you may only have a one-time release. You may only have a close collaboration. Like ideally we want everyone to get to the point where they're living and working openly because that's where a lot of the benefit comes from, from, you know, shared uh, 
shared peer review. So even in like our Department of Defense has a digital service and the NSA was one of the earliest projects to work on SE Linux, which arguably is one of the most important security access role-based policies for multi-user systems that has come out, period, in open source. And that's wide open on the internet in collaboration with the academic community in 1990s. So there's a rich history of even in the sensitive areas, you might be able to share more than you think. And that's why we need advocates like Hans and a lot of the people in this group helping to let people feel more comfortable with and alleviate the risks. That is fantastic. Now, unfortunately, because time is always too short, we're really going to have to dig into this deeper in a community call later. But for the summit, our time for our little panel session is over. So thank you so much, Remy and Hans, for sharing your stories about inner source and government.